All right, today we're going to take a look at some properties of the electron. Um, and basically we're going to look at what these experimenters did um, early on in the 1920s and 30s, basically, um, where we are looking at how they discovered um, so many of the things we kind of take for granted about the electron. Um, and some of the experiments they did using stuff we already know are actually pretty ingenious. So let's take a look. Two major scientists, J.J. Thompson and Robert Millikan. Now we've talked about both these guys before. Thompson was the raisin bun model guy of the atom, and Millikan with his oil drop experiment, we're going to come back to that actually and review it a little bit. Thompson, kind of interesting here actually, um, Thompson found that um, you could do things with these cathode rays that um, required both, um, could show, I should say, not required, showed both how it reacts to an electric field as well as a magnetic field. And sometimes we think, well, Rutherford did his thing. He found out that Thompson was wrong, um, and then Thompson was just done. This was, in fact, incorrect. Thompson still continued being an experimenter, was a brilliant man, after Rutherford found that the raisin bun model wasn't the final say. Um, so let's, let's keep going here. One of the things Thompson did is he set up a regular cathode ray and added, and you can see I've sort of drawn in red, um, some electric plates, and then in blue, um, a solenoid or a Helmholtz coil, basically a solenoid wrapped around um, this cathode ray tube. Right, so we've got this kind of a uh, bell-shaped evacuated basically vacuum tube um, with wires protruding from it. Um, we've got the cathode here. Basically this is the source of our electrons. Here's our anode. Most of them actually hit the anode, but then there's this hole in the middle, and that hole in the middle is going to allow a beam of these cathode rays to go through. Right. And then depending on what we do with the electric field um, and the magnetic field, they're going to hit the far end at Z or somewhere between Z and Y or somewhere between Z and X. Right. And we're going to investigate how he did that. Um, so there's the electron gun to start. We've got these deflection fields, as I was telling you about, and then this fluorescent screen at the end. That's what I didn't mention is we're seeing that the electrons are landing at this because there is this fluorescent screen. So when they hit that screen at the end of the cathode ray tube, they're going to basically make it glow, and it makes it easy for us to see exactly where they're hitting. All right. Um, so electron gun, there's a potential difference. Cathode becomes negatively charged, anode becomes positively charged. Electrons on the cathode are attracted to the anode. This should be review, actually. Basically, this is like a um, electric field with parallel plates. Um, thus, these electrons at the cathode speed up from rest. And if they are moving directly horizontally, they'll actually only then and only then go through both the first hole in the anode and then in the second hole also in this next disk. And that allows us, like I said before, to get this nice straight beam of electrons. Um, the deflection fields, now we don't show it here, but these, let me draw them in another color, let's make them green. These wires here, it's underneath and in between the coil, this comes out, this one comes out. Right, these are somewhere off kind of behind the cathode ray or wherever, hooked up to another potential difference. So then the question we gotta ask ourselves is what is the direction of the electric field? And you gotta think back to electric fields and go, okay, electric fields, let me think. Positive test charge, which way is a positive test charge going to move? Oh, it's going to move down. And so indeed, our electric field is directed downwards. You can always think about it this way too. Electric field always goes from positive to negative. Okay, um, So electric field is moving downward. 
um, what would be the direction of the electric force on the electron? And here you have to remember back to this. Remember that that electric field is acting on a, po we get the direction as if it's acting on a positive test charge. The electron is not a positive test charge or positive in any way, shape of, or kind, kind of charge. And so the electric force, in this case because it's an, a negatively charged electron, Fe is directed upwards. And you can see of these three paths, right, one, two, three, um, you can make a quick deduction of which path is this most likely to take, and it's going to be this one here, if there's only the electric force acting on the electron. All right, because the charge Q is negative, E and Fe go in opposite directions, electric force is upward. Also, think about the plates hey, it's attracted to the positive plate. It's going to be moving upwards. It's going to be deflected or repelled, sorry, by the negative plate. It's going to move upwards. Um, it's moving fast enough. It's not going to actually hit the top plate, but it will be deflected for the whole time that it's going in between the plates. Um, so if, if Fe is the only force, like I was just saying, we could describe the nature of the electron's motion. Um, it's going to deflect the electron upward. Once it comes out of that um, electric plate, it's going to move then in a straight line and going to hit the phosphorescent, sorry, the fluorescent screen roughly at Y, at least according to the way we've drawn it here. Um, parabolic motion, away we go. Um, so in inside the plates, so up to here-ish, from where it goes into the plates, parabolic motion. Um, then this section here, once we're out of the plates, it's linear motion. Um, imagine, if you will, um, a weight or something like that on a string. Right? I can be whirling it around my head. As soon as I let go of it, it goes in a straight line. Okay, then we get a glow at location Y. Beautiful. Um, then we've got the magnetic field. Solenoids on either side of the coil, Helmholtz coils, named after guess who? His last name was Helmholtz, yes. Um, and these are on either side of the parallel plates, and they create a strong and uniform, that's important as well, magnetic field inside and between them. So, oops, slow down, there we go. Electron flow around the Solenoids is counterclockwise, as shown there. So what's the direction of the magnetic field inside the solenoid? So in that case there, we got to think, okay, what do we got going on here? Which, which hand rule is this going to be? You think, okay, oh yeah, this is going to be the second hand rule. It's going to be left hand, because these are electrons and they're negatively charged. And so we have our fingers pointing in the direction of electron flow and our thumb is going to go into the page or into the screen or into whatever we're talking about. Um, and that means the electric field is moving into the page as we've got these little X's to show that. So that's left hand rule number two we use to show that or figure that part out. Next step and in your notes, this says magnetic. And I had changed it in one place I had it saved, but apparently not in both. I was going to be all proud of myself for having um, proper proofreading skills, and I messed it up anyways. So that should say magnetic force. Um, F. M. There we go. So magnetic force on the electron. Well, this is going to be our third left-hand rule. Um, and if we look at that, my fingers are going into the page. My thumb shows me the direction of the electron's motion. And my palm is pointing in the direction of the magnetic force, which will be downwards. Love. 
Lovely. So this is a great kind of review of our magnetic field stuff because here we're talking about not only um, second left-hand rule, now we've got third left-hand rule, uh, we've got electric fields, we've got magnetic fields, they're all coming back. So all this stuff we've already learned is now showing up again. So if Fm is the only force, right, so if there's only magnetic field, so we've turned off these electric plates, right, so we're pretending this is not positively charged, right, we've disconnected the voltage source, these are not negatively charged, they're just sitting there, neutral. Um, the only force acting on the electron is the magnetic force, it's going to move down, it's going to be deflected downward into uniform circular motion. Right, so it will be basically some portion of circular motion as long as it is, again, in between the plates. As soon as it comes out, straight line linear motion until it hits the screen at the X. Um, and then we've got um, a glow there. Lovely. So, J.J. Thompson. Now, he was doing his experiments prior to Millikan's oil drop experiment, all right? So he was doing this experiment. He did not know the charge. He did not know the mass of the electron. Um, but he was able to find the ratio of those two, which we might think, okay, what's the point in that? Um, but he was thinking, well, maybe somebody else is able to find one or the other, um, and then he, you can use my work to figure out the one that we don't know. So he used basically two steps. First of all, um, he turned on the electric field and the magnetic field and adjusted them so that the electrons went through with no deflection. Right. So he found out, well, first of all, he found out where is this spot, this Z spot, going to be on the fluorescent screen with neither electric field or magnetic field. Um, and then he went through and said, okay, now let's turn on the electric field. And if we just have electric, right, we're going to be up here. All right. Then he says, okay, let's turn up the magnetic field. So increase voltage, increase voltage, increase voltage. We get this dot moving down and down and down and down and eventually to the same spot. So now it's undeflected. Now, if this is moving in a straight line, it's moving through at a constant velocity, no deflection. What do we know about the forces acting on it? We know that we've got uniform motion. These are balanced forces. Fe is equal to Fm, or at least the absolute value, right? If we're dis disregarding direction, Fm equals Fe. Perfect. This is easy stuff. And if Fm is equal to Fe, well, then we also know a couple things about that because we should know the strength of the magnetic field, B, and the uh, electric field, E. So now we can kind of substitute some things in. And we see on our formula sheet, right, Fm is equal to QVB. Lovely, there it is. Um, just to make sure, on your formula sheet, the perpendicular sign is between the V and the B. Um, it doesn't matter. It's just showing, here it's showing that the magnetic field is perpendicular to the velocity. On your formula sheet, it's showing that the velocity is perpendicular to the magnetic field. Um, both ways say the same thing. Um, so QVB is equal to QE. Okay, lovely. Those are both formulas right off of your um, data sheet. Um, the one that you're going to see for the where we got this bit, FE is equal to QE, actually comes from this formula. Ooh. E is equal to FE over Q. Right, and you can see, I think, pretty quick how that's been rearranged 
to say that Fe is equal to Q times E because I can multiply both sides by Q. The Q on this side goes away. We're left with QE on this side. And then we take this and we toss it in there for the Fe. Anyways, so therefore continuing on, what else can we do with this? Well, the charges cancel because we can divide both sides by Q and there's a Q on both sides, lovely. So we're left with V times the magnetic field is equal to E. Okay, lovely. Um, we know both of those, right? Or we can calculate them based on the amount of current or the voltage that's going through them um, in terms of the magnetic field strength, in terms of the electric field strength, which means we can figure this out. V is equal to delta E. Sorry, not delta E. My apologies. That is not delta E. That would be energy. V is equal to electric field. So be careful. Don't do what I just did. Um, be careful that when you are looking at this E with the arrow on top of it, so it's a vector. In this case, again, we've got the absolute value sign around it, which means we don't care about directions, but it is a vector. It is not energy. Energy is always scalar. Um, and this B actually, in if we're being very precise this is a vector so it should have a b above or um, arrow above it um, so you can find the speed of the electron right. so now we can do this same thing um, with a alpha particle right so if an alpha particle is going through here um, the deflection is going to be the same, just in opposite directions. Here, right, we've got positive on top, negative on the bottom. Electric field is going to want to drag it down. Magnetic field, we'd use the right-hand rule, um, is going to keep it straight. That means it's got to be directed upwards. Okay, so direction-wise, so we have to do this whole example here, but the direction of the external magnetic field um, it's traveling undeflected. So it basically, it's going to travel in a straight line. Now, electric force is going to be pushing down on it. That means our magnetic force has to be equal and opposite. Right? It's going to be balanced forces. Um, the question that we need to know is what is the magnitude and direction of the external magnetic field? Well, I can tell you the direction already because I know two parts that I need to get to the direction. Right? I know that the magnetic force is going up. I know it's a positively charged particle. And I know the particle is moving that direction. So this is going to be my third hand rule. It's positive, so it's a right hand rule. Um, and in order for my thumb to be moving to the right and my palm to be facing upward, my fingers are pointing into the page, right? And so in terms of my magnetic field, I'm going to draw my little crosshairs like this, right? The arrow flights are moving away from me and my B field is going into the page. Right now, what else do I need to figure out about this? Well, um, I know based on what we just figured out before, um, but I'll derive it again here. So I know that Fe has to equal Fm. And I want you to make sure that you are working through this. If you need to pause this, go ahead and do that. Um, so Fe, okay, lovely. We just figured out that's going to be Qe. We don't know that yet. But as I look at my question, there's more information that I think we can use to figure it out. Uh, so Qe is equal to Qv perpendicular. Right, Q divided by Q on both sides. I can just get rid of the Q by dividing both sides by Q. Um, and I need to find the, well, I've got the direction. I need the magnitude of that 
magnetic field. So I'm going to divide both sides by V. Divide by V. And so I'm left with, and that's V perpendicular, um, B is equal to my electric field E. over V. Now I have V is right there. E, okay, I don't have that directly. And I have to be careful, this is a lowercase V, it's not voltage. Um, even though I do have voltage here, oh, I have voltage, and I have distance. And I look back at my formula sheet and go, is there a way to find electric field from those? And indeed there is. Um, in your electricity and magnetism section, we've got a formula that says, well, E, is equal to my potential difference, capital V, voltage, over distance. Beautiful. Um, so I'm going to, now you can solve for this, 100 divided by, make sure you change this to meters, 0 0.08 meters. Take that number, plug it into there. I could also say, well, I'm just going to say that, th I'm going to substitute the, this thing in for the E. So now B... is equal to voltage divided by distance times 1 over speed, which means in reality, does that make sense? Because this, sorry, I should just, I'm jumping ahead mathematically here. Um, this is the same as my electric field times 1 over the speed. Now I've taken, here's this voltage divided by distance, that's my electric field, times 1 over the V. Okay. So B is equal to voltage divided by distance multiplied by velocity. We're, we've kind of simplified it down. It's not going to be a super difficult question at this point. So it's 100 volts divided by 0 0.08. 0 meters multiplied by 7.8. Zero times ten to the sixth meters per second. Actually, punch this into your calculator and make sure that you can get the correct answer here. And Make sure if you're doing it all in one step that you've got the right amount of brackets around the stuff in the bottom of this fraction. And to the correct number of significant digits, my magnetic field strength is going to be 1.7857 is on my calculator, so 1.8, because it's times 10 to the negative 4, and the unit here is going to be Teslas. So if you want to see this step by step, maybe, there we go. Um, so finding out the direction, we can do that already. Um, magnetic field is going to act into the page, lovely. 
Um, and then we want to find the magnitude of it. Um, here we actually found out it's 1,250 volts per meter. Um, right, this was the finding the electric field strength. I did it all in one step. Here's showing how you figure it out in kind of two steps. Um, we get my electric field strength is 1,250 volts per meter. Um, E divided by speed is that, and same answer as we just got. All right. Thompson, so the long story here, um, we did some math behind it. So first of all, Thompson figured out, okay, um, the speed of the electron. Basically, the whole undeflected bit with both electric and magnetic field was there to figure out the speed of the electron. Um, so he then turned off the parallel plates. So now we have no charge here or here. These are lovely and neutral. And all we have is magnetic field. And this is going to cause the electron to deflect downwards. Recall, right, the, in this place, inside the coil, it's in uniform circular motion. So reviewing uniform circular motion really quickly, right? Considering an electron moving in a perpendicular magnetic field, what is the direction of FM when it first enters the field? So if we look at this, it's an electron, so it's negative. I'm going to use my left hand. Third left hand rule is what I need. So fingers into the page, thumb pointing in the direction of the speed. FM is going to be... That is supposed to point straight down. It is not pointing straight down. I'm just going to say that it points straight down when it first enters the field. Basically, it's always going to be perpendicular to the motion of the um, electron, which is going to make it move in uniform circular motion. Um, so the direction of the acceleration is in the same direction as the net force acting on it. So it's going to be down, right? Because FM is the only force that we care about acting on this thing. So FM is the, F, is the net force, which means acceleration is in the same direction as the net force. Second law right there. Um, this is called centripetal acceleration because acceleration is perpendicular to velocity um, because the, the magnitude of the velocity remains constant, um, but the direction is continually changing. And then that really is generating uniform circular motion. FM here is then called the centripetal force since it is responsible for moving the charge in a circle. FM and AC act towards the center of the circle. They are both centripetal. All right. So when we're talking about uniform circular motion and we have unbalanced forces, principle of our physics that we're dealing with here. As soon as we see unbalanced fortune, forces, sorry, we know this is Newton's second law. F net equals mass times acceleration. Um, and this is going to deal with uniform acceleration. Um, and because it's centripetal acceleration, Fm is equal to mass times centripetal acceleration. Fm is QVB is equal to mv squared over r. All right, so we can divide both sides by v. Now we've got qb equals mv over r. And at this point, Thompson did not know the mass, so he didn't know m. He also did not know the charge of the electron. So what he decided to do mathematically is, well, let's get these two unknowns by themselves on the left side of the equation, and let's determine the charge to mass ratio. So divide both sides by mass, right? So divide by m, divide by m. 
mass on this side goes away. Now I have charge divided by mass times magnetic field. And I can now divide both sides by magnetic field strength. All right, there we go. That goes away on this side. I'm left with V over BR on the other side. And so the charge to mass ratio is equal to the speed of the particle divided by the magnetic field strength. Um, and then the magnetic field's got to be multiplied by the radius of the circular motion. Um, so Thompson knew the speed of the electron from step one, right? When we did um, both Fe is equal to Fm, and we use both the uh, electric fields and the magnetic fields. That was that long first derivation of how do we get the velocity of the electron. Now we've got it. Um, he had a formula to determine the magnetic field inside of the Helmholtz coils. Um, and he could determine the radius of curvature from where the electrons hit the fluorescent screen. Some trigonometry there that's... Um, using the known values for V, B, and R, he determined that the charge to mass ratio of the electron, so electrons charge divided by its mass, is equal to 1.76 times 10 to the 11th cou coulombs per, bah, per kilogram. All right. So, 4.80 times 10 to the negative 19th coulomb particle moving at 5 times 10 to the 6 meters per second is deflected in a, let's make it so we can actually read that, 3.70 milli tesla perpendicular magnetic field. The diameter of its circular pass is 19.0 millimeters. Find its mass, ignore its weight. So be careful with that. We do want mass. We are, when it says ignore its weight, it means ignore gravity. Gravity acting on this particle is probably not going to be very big, um, but it would just make the math a lot more complicated. So let's take a look at what we're going to do with this. So going back to, sorry, let me just jump back to the question. Um, perpendicular magnetic field, diameter of its circular path, as soon as we see that, it's like, ah, okay, F net equals MA, and this is in fact... AC. And the only force acting on it is the magnetic force. So FM equals MAC. QVB is equal to MV squared divided by R. All right. Divide by V. Divide by V. Left with QB equals MV over R. Lovely. Now, in this case, I know the charge, right? I'm given the charge in my original question, All right? So let's work through that here. Um, now that you've kind of looked ahead, come back to this slide, see if you can work through it. Pause it and see if you can come up with this formula on your own, okay? Um, I'm gonna work through it step by step here for you. Um, so if you need hints, you can kind of look. So this is unbalanced forces because it is moving in circular motion. Only force acting on it is the magnetic force. So this is Fm. And the type of acceleration we've got here is centripetal acceleration. FM, there are two formulas we have, but one of them is um, talking about amperage and the length of a, a line. That's not the one we want, so we are going to use QVB. QVB, and this is going to be mass times, ex centripetal acceleration is V squared over R. At this point, divide both sides by V. Get rid of this one. Divide by V. 
B gets rid of the squared. Okay. Um, we want to know the mass. So at this point here, I can start to simplify a little bit more. I want the M by itself. So I'm going to multiply both sides by R. I'm going to divide both sides by M. Divide by M. And I am left with. Never mind me, let's try that again. We do not want to divide by M. That would be getting V by itself. Um, oops. Too back. Went back too far. Uh, there we go. We want to get M by itself. We're going to multiply both sides by R. Divide both sides by V. Lovely. Um, so multiply by R. Divide by V. Got to do the same thing on both sides. R goes away. R goes away. V goes away. V goes away. I am left with M is equal to R Q B all divided by V. Um, so let's just work our way up here to finish this off. Um, M then is going to be equal to the radius. Ooh, this is diameter. So I've got to change this. Uh, this is going to be 9.5 millimeters. I need to change that to meters. So depending on how lazy I feel, 9.5 millimeters is the same as 9.5 times 10 to the negative 3 meters. Or 0, 0.0. 0, 0.95. Either way works. Um, so my radius, again, 9.5. Remember, I divided by 19 by 2. That's when I got the 9.5. Times 10 to the negative 3 meters. Times Q. Now, I'm told in this case, I do know the charge. Somehow we already knew the charge. Um, I definitely ran out of room, but I can do this. B, I'm told, is 3.7 milliteslas, so that's going to be, again, times 10 to the negative 3. All of this divided by the speed. My answer, as I look at it, should have three significant digits because all of my initial information does as well. And so now it's just a matter of using my calculator and make sure you can do this on yours as well. Three point three seven times ten to the negative thirty kilograms. And lovely, you can see then how the math works out step by step here. And really, that's what it is. Positively charged particle enters a 2.0 Tesla magnetic field 
at a speed of 5 times 10 to the 7 meters per second goes into uniform circular motion with a radius of 11 centimeters. So this is Q to us. Ooh, slow down. Um, first of all, is its path counterclockwise, sorry, clockwise, CW, or counterclockwise, CCW? I think while it's a positively charged particle, we don't know what the charge is, um, but it is positively charged, so this is going to be a right-hand rule, and it's going to be the third right-hand rule. Um, so in this case, we know that the magnetic field is into the page. My thumb is pointing to the right, because that's the way the um, charged particle originally is moving, um, which means it's going to move upwards and eventually is going to do something like this. We've got to figure, okay, what direction is that? And this is going to be counterclockwise. Clock moves the other way. And now what's its charge to mass, charge to mass ratio? Um, so this is again simply employing what um, Thompson did. So we come down to basically QVB. I'm kind of shortcutting to that part. QVB equals MV squared over R. How did I get there? Well, remember, F net equals mass times acceleration. The net force acting on this is the magnetic field. FM equals MAC. AC is V squared over R times the mass is equal to QVB. All right. So at this point here, right, it's like, okay, well, we got to get rid of some velocity here. So that can go away if I divide both sides by V and that goes away as well. I want to get charge to mass ratio. So I'm going to actually divide both sides by B and divide both sides by um, M. Which means M on this side, on the right hand side, goes away. B on the left side goes away. I'm left with a charge to mass ratio, Q over M. Let's make that actually look like a Q. Um, is equal to V over B. R. Q over M equals 5.0 times 10 to the 7th meters per second. Divide by the magnetic field strength. OK, that's two Teslas. Radius is 11 centimeters, so that's going to be 0 0.11 meters. Actually, 110 meters. And here we go. Q over M is equal to, and do some calculator work here, 5 times 10 to the 7th. Make sure you put your brackets in the right place. And charge to mass ratio here is going to be 2.272727. So 2.27. Uh, whoa, be careful. Two significant digits. 2.3. times 10 to the 8th and this is going to be cool oh, come on coulombs per kilogram how do I know those should be my units um, well I know those should be my units because charges measured in coulombs 
mass is measured in kilograms. I could go through and use the fact that I know how to figure out what Tesla's, um, I could use that, that would turn eventually back into Newtons. Um, Newtons are kilogram meter per second and we'd eventually get ourselves to Coulombs per kilogram, but we're going to leave that for now. Okay, so we already figured this part out, so it's counterclockwise. And then here's all of the other work to get to here. So, using his cathode ray tube, Thompson was not able to determine either the mass or the charge of the electron. He could get the charge to mass ratio. Millikan. 1911 used the oil drop experiment to determine the charge of the electron. Reviewing his experiments, we've got oil droplets, right? We find the charge of an oil droplet. Um, at first, they fell due to gravity. Um, oil droplets were charged by friction through the atomizer or by ionizing radiation, as in x-rays. Um, as a result, they could be affected by the electric field. Um, he adjusted the voltage of the plates until he suspended one of the oil droplets, as in he kept it at rest. Um, let's look at force on the oil droplet. Well, gravity is pulling it down. Electric force is going to be pulling it up. Right? So the electric force has to be equal but opposite if gravity is pulling it down, right? Now, this is gravity here is significant because we're dealing with an oil drop. Um, we're not dealing with just an electron. The force of gravity acting on an electron is tiny. force of a, a, gravity acting on an oil drop, which although is tiny, is many, many, many times bigger than an electron, is significant enough we have to pay attention to it. Um, given this situation right here, what kind of charge does the oil droplet have? Now we got to think about it. If Fe is pulling it up towards positive, it's got to be negative. Um, we could also think about, well, electric field goes from positive to negative. If Fe is moving in opposite directions, it tells us that Q is negative. Both get us to the same point. All right, what principle do we have here? Well, we have uniform, sorry, I should say balanced forces, right? And uniform motion as in we're at rest. So what's the equation here? Well, it's going to be Fe is equal to Fg, or more correctly, absolute value of Fe is equal to the absolute value of Fg. Right. As soon as we know that, well, away we go. Um, QE, we can figure out the electric field strength if we know how far the plates are and we know the voltage, is equal to mg. Divide both sides by E, I end up with this. And this will tell me the charge on the oil droplet. Now, this does not immediately get us to the charge of the electron. Um, if you remember what Millikan did, right, so okay, E is equal to V over D. Um, he was able to determine the electric field with a voltmeter and a ruler. All right? If we know the voltage, we know the distance, we can figure out the electric field. Lovely. Um, but remember, Millikan didn't just do this once. He found the charges on many oil drops. And then, how do you get from there to the charge of an electron? Well, what he found is when you arrange them in ascending order, they're quantized. Right? They're all multiples of 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19. And he interpreted that to say that that is the smallest possible charge. Right? He never measured anything smaller than that. He never got to like 0 0.8 times 10 to the negative 19. And so he said, this is the elementary charge.
right? All of the rest of these are just multiples, right? 3.2, well, that's 2 times the 1.6 times the 19. 4.8, oh, that's 3 times that. 4 times that, and excuse me, and so on. Um, so he believed that the elementary charge then was the magnitude of the electron's charge. Right? We've looked at this stuff already. Q is equal to N times E, where E is the elementary charge, N is the number of electrons in excess or deficit. Um, so we've got this, right? There's our mass of our oil drop. It's tiny, negative 16. But if you think about it, compare that to the mass of an electron, which we've now determined is 9.11 times 10 to the negative 31. This is significantly heavier, sorry, significantly more massive than the um, electron. Right, suspended in between there, lovely. Let's determine the number of electrons in excess or deficit on our oil droplets. So what do we know? Well, the distance between the plates is going to be 4.6 plus 4.6. So D is equal to 9.20 centimeters or 0 0.0920 meters or 9.20 times 10 to the negative 2 meters. You choose. Um, v, voltage, is going to be 650 volts. We've got the mass. Um, G, we're on Earth, so it's 9.81. Um, away we go. It's suspended. That means uniform motion, or it's at rest, so it's uniformly moving, not at all, um, which means our forces are balanced. So we've got gravity pulling down. And we've got Fe pulling up, which means Fe equals Fg, which means Qe it's supposed to be an arrow there uh, is equal to mg. Divide both sides by. E. Actually, one second, let's go back and do this. Let's actually look at the formula that we have for E. Well, E is equal to V over D, voltage divided by distance. So let's substitute that in already. All right, so we're going to multiply both sides by D. Divide both sides by the voltage. And that's going to get rid of my voltage here and my distance here, leaving just Q. Um, now, we move on. And Q is equal to MG. D divided by voltage. Um, our mass here is given originally. I've now covered it up. 5.76 times 10 to the negative 16. Kilograms multiplied by nine point eight one meters per second squared multiplied by zero. 0, 0.920 0 meters come on making my computer work here apparently all divided by the voltage which it tells us here is 650 volts 
Now this is going to get us charge. We're going to have to have, have to figure out how many electrons it requires to make this charge in just a moment here. So 5.76 times 10 to the negative 16 times 5.1 times 0 0.020. And we have two, three significant digits, 8.00 times 10 to the negative 19, or if you will, 7.997715, and so on. Um, so right, my calculator spits this out. I can leave the unrounded value if I want. Um, remembering back to charge is then going to equal the number of electrons multiplied by the elementary charge. I want to find the number of electrons, so I'm going to divide both sides by the elementary charge. So n is going to be equal to my charge there of q over the elementary charge. So n is going to equal this answer here. That's on my calculator, 7.9977, etc. Coulombs divided by the elementary charge of 1.60 times 10 to the negative 19 coulombs. And I apologize, um, this 7.9977, etc., is also times 10 to the negative 19. Times 10 to the negative 19. And when we do this math, it's going to equal 5. And that has to be a whole number, and so it does work out nicely here. Again, oops. my calculator 4.9985, whatever. Um, but again, to three significant digits, it's going to be 5. This n number needs to be a whole number. So if it does not round to a whole number, it probably tells you you've done something wrong. All right, so a step at a time, we can work our way through it. All right, so I never actually calculated the electric field strength, but I could have. I just did the math all at once. Um, Um, oh, we should also, I guess, talk about the nature of the charge. This is one thing I did not um, go through. I missed doing that back here. Oops, sit down. So nature of the charge, I'm like, well, if I look at my setup here, this is negative, and this is positive. Now, I assume their electrons are negative, but let's pretend we didn't know that. If Fg is pulling it down, um, and Fe is pushing it up, well, it's got to be negatively charged for it to be attracted to that positively charged plate, or be repelled by the negatively charged plate on the bottom. So it does have to be a negatively charged particle. And there we go. Have fun. There's some questions as well for you.